Next from Springfield, we speak with Greg Bays, the president and CEO of the Illinois Manufacturers Association. Mr. Bays discusses his association's growth and opportunity initiative, the effect of a lack of qualified workers for Illinois manufacturing jobs, and why many industry leaders are choosing to relocate their businesses out of Illinois. This runs about 30 minutes. Greg Bays, thank you for joining us again on the Illinois Channel. Mm -hmm. Nice to be here. You recently had a press release saying that you were going to be starting a Main Street Growth and Opportunity uh, initiative, and I wanted to hear, first of all, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. What would it do, and, and why do you think it's necessary? Well, the IMA is joining together with um, medium-sized, small, and large businesses across the country in a uh, effort to make sure we bring to the congressional leaders' attention the need for several reforms that need to take place in this country, not the least of which is tax reform. Um, you've heard a little bit about it being discussed in Washington, but like a lot of other things, it seems to be caught up in the gridlock that's occurring out there. Uh, why is it important to all kinds of businesses uh, in uh, Illinois and across the nation? Um, the, the country faces uh, right now an economic growth question and problems. And while there are pockets of uh, certainly growth and things that are going on, it's not uniform. And one of the problems we see is that the tax code of the United States really keeps uh, businesses from having an opportunity to grow. We have the highest corporate rate of any industrial country in the world, around 36 percent. Lease needs to be in and around the area of 25 percent. We have a double taxation issue with dividends. Companies are taxed on their earnings, and then um, uh, people who have stock in those companies and are taxed on the capital gains for those particular uh, dividends. That is something that most other industrialized company, countries do not do. Uh, for S-Corps, most of my members of the Illinois Manufacturers Association are small and medium-sized manufacturers. They're organized as LLCs or S-Corps, meaning that the profits from those companies flow through the individual's individual tax forms. And so with the high rates that we have, that also keeps growth from occurring. And estate taxes, an important issue as well, especially in a state like Illinois, where you have a state, a state tax. Uh, farmers who are part of this coalition as well, the Illinois Farm Bureau and leadership there also are participating. That's an area that we also think needs to be worked, at, worked on. So this along with several other issues, trade authority, immigration, and just fiscal responsibility are items that we felt was important to join with this organization to bring to the attention of our uh, congressional leaders, our, congr our congressmen at the local level, of why these kind of issues are important to making changes at the national level and also of course things that we have going on right here at our own state capitol. What kind of a reception? Who are you talking to on the congressional level? And actually I was kind of surprised to hear that you're doing this. This isn't just an Illinois initiative. No. You're trying to do this nationwide. No. How receptive are the Congress people that you've talked with? Well, they're, they're, they're always receptive and the problem with Congress, whether it be at the, the House or the Senate, each individual member of Congress wants to do the right thing. The problem of it is getting uh, the caucuses to move forward. As we know, this administration at loggerheads with uh, the Congress, specifically the House, makes it difficult. But we did have discussion earlier in the year. Representative uh, Congressman Dave Camp has uh, had a program that was out there. It doesn't look like it's going to move forward with a wide array of many of the things that we're talking about. So as these discussions continue, and they will after the midterm elections, we want to be in a position to make sure that all aspects of the economy are able to be heard from and how will various things impact it. Let's take, for example, immigration, an issue that we hear a lot about, important in Illinois as well. Uh, we would like to see uh, an immigration plan passed. Why? Uh, a growing economy needs more people in its, uh, in, into the workforce each and every day. Manufacturing, as an example, um, we have over 30,000 jobs retiring in Illinois alone out of the 600,000 manufacturer workers that we have in the state. That group needs to be replaced every year. So if we do not have workers that want to come to this area and work and or do we have the training for our current population to be able to fill those jobs, then that's when manufacturers specifically start looking for other places to go and look for an opportunity to make their product. You know, it's an interesting problem that here when we have such high unemployment in the state, that on the other hand, one of the issues that you just touched on there is the fact that 
businesses at any number of manufacturing levels, uh, and I've had these conversations with business leaders in the field, are having a problem finding qualified people Absolutely. to move in and replace. They don't have the skills. It might be welding. It might be any number of things. And exactly. it's not just having a warm body. The, uh, the problem is exactly that. Uh, the National Manufacturers Association estimates on any given day in the United States over half a million manufacturing jobs are vacant that could be filled. And, uh, and these are typically really good paying jobs. These are, right? you know, the average manufacturing job in Illinois is about a $73,000 uh, a year job. That's well and above the, the mean average for employment in this state. So when people want to talk about the importance of an issue like minimum wage jobs, increasing the minimum wage, no. What we should be talking about is how do we get people trained to take the welding jobs that a Caterpillar or a machine shop in a small town, Illinois, has available. Where do they get that certificate? We at the IMA work very hard and diligently with our community college system and high schools to try to provide those opportunities for young people to get those certifications. So example, when those jobs are available, they don't take eight to 12 weeks of training to learn how to do a weld that Caterpillar has to have for their machinery. They immediately can come in, two weeks of training, boom, they're right on the job. So those are the kinds of issues that our congressional leaders, our state leaders need to hear about. That those are the kinds of efforts that could have an immediate impact on our unemployment level, which in Illinois remains the highest in the nation. When you talk about immigration, as you well know, probably any number of people, because of the pictures they've seen on TV, imagine immigration always applying to illegal Im right. immigrants crossing the Mexican border. You're, you're not really looking at that aspect of it. I, I think you're talking about immigration at a level where, uh, well, when we recently talked to Doug Whitley of the state chamber. He was talking about the people that come over from China, the engineers from right. uh, different uh, countries around the world. Uh, and yet, we allow them to go back and, and lose that brain power that because of our immigration. I right. think that's maybe... That's exactly what... Uh, two points. One, because we're not a border state, we don't have the kinds of issues that are legitimate issues that Arizona and Texas and other uh, California, they have, that put strains on the social services side of those particular states. We don't particularly experience that here. What we do have, however, though, are in the Latino community, a uh, large number of folks who have immigrated here to try to find work. Those folks need to be looked at. But also the visas, as what you were referring to, of people uh, in uh, being able to stay here and we continue utilizing their good success that they've had at our university system. Uh, the world still wants to come to America to be educated, but we don't keep them here. And part of that problem is the limited number of H-1 visas that are available from individual com countries to keep those employees in, in place. And indeed, I can talk to members, and when I visit manufacturing facilities, as I know you have, you see that it is not the vision of what people think a manufacturing floor looks like. It is Hispanic. It is the various ethnic groups that are there. There are other languages being spoken on that shop floor. Uh, example of a major manufacturer in the Chicago, it, in the city limits of Chicago, talking about the tool and die makers that they have that are all in their late 50s and early 60s of Polish descent, trained 25, 30 years ago, retiring can't find the replacement for those those individuals. That's difficult and that company will have to make a decision. Can we stay in what is probably a challenge because you're still in a city neighborhood or am I attracted to go someplace else, whether it be Indiana, whether it be Texas, or even outside the border of the United States. And that brings us to another point about the, the Main Street uh, group that we are working with. That the, the need of tax reform has been really brought home to Illinois, I think, recently in the fact that the Walgreens Corporation made quite a bit of news in saying, quote, it might have to take a look at relocating its headquarters to Switzerland because of the state, for the country's federal tax level that we have. Now think about that, that we're going to potentially lose homegrown, nothing more says Illinois than a company like Walgreens or a Caterpillar as an example or whatever, but because of the tax rate, their shareholders demand that they look for that return on the dollar investment and therefore looking at a relocation of a headquarters and the taxation that would take place in a Switzerland versus Deerfield, Illinois has to be examined. In the big picture, as we look, let's just look at Illinois. As the head of the Illinois Manufacturers Association, you have your fingers on the pulse. You talk to those who are making the products. Let's talk about two things. One, what are you hearing? And 
let's start off just before we do that. It's interesting when we say manufacturers. I think people don't necessarily know. Let's just name some of the things that are actually made in Illinois. I think it's always kind of interesting when people find out uh, some of the things that are made. They go, oh, I didn't know that was made here. Oh, there are all sorts of items that uh, right here in uh, Springfield, the Monomatic uh, folks who uh, make uh, various industrial coffee makers and things that are all over the world in hospitals, major buildings and things of that nature, the manufacturing that occurs right here in the backyard to Jelly Belly candies as an example up in North Chicago that people see. In fact, the, the little statistic that you'll learn about a Jelly Belly, which is the size just a little bit bigger than a pea, actually takes longer to make than an automobile because of the coating <laughs> that it takes of putting that sugar and wrapping around it and things. It's those kind of interesting things that you find out too. Obviously, everybody knows Caterpillar. Everybody knows John Deere. But think about that. These are homegrown or country, uh, companies that are everywhere in the world and uh, Caterpillar really coming as a growth out of World War II and what their involvement was in, in helping fuel the industrial might of this country to, to uh, win the uh, World War II to a deer that actually started in the middle of uh, north central Illinois in a very small town and has grown to a worldwide manufacturer. So the history, the rich history of manufacturing in this state from food processing, uh, steel, heavy equipment manufacturing. And pharmaceutical, to, which would be and, like a white room. Abs- I mean, the opposite of a industrial Very much so dodge. when you think of Abbott Laboratories, Pfizer, or uh, Baxter, and, and Takeda, a Japanese company, but headquartered its United States headquarters in the suburban areas uh, in Chicago. So there is a rich history, but you ask, what am I hearing? What I hear is not good. Uh, the, the reputation of this state continues to be damaged by its fiscal irresponsibility, its inability to get its pension problems under control. And what I have heard, and I've been in this job now for over 20 years, and what uh, I've never heard before with such uh, uh, so often is the fact that if things don't change, we have to look at moving. We're concerned about growing in this uh, state. When I visit a manufacturing May I ask, is it an economic issue or is it more the political culture? Are people thinking that this state is just too corrupt and they don't trust the process or? Well, they may not trust the process, but I don't think it is for a corrupt standpoint that they believe that we have an inability to really solve the problems that we face. Let's face it, Illinois still has an enormous amount of strengths and positives. There's a reason that we are what we are today, the transportation, the financial center of Chicago, the richness of our agricultural uh, base in the state. There's a reason Illinois has grown to be what it is. But what we've seen, I think, in the last decade or so is a lack of leadership in being able to come to grips with these problems that everybody's facing. But when you read about the fact that people believe California is in better shape than Illinois, you just got to scratch your head and say, how did that happen? The point here is that we want to see, manufacturers want to see, let's get control of these problems. And those problems rank from the fiscal irresponsibility, and it's not just about the fact of rolling back a temporary tax that takes the state income tax from 35 to 5%, but it's how that money is being spent. What is the priorities? Are we taking care of our infrastructure needs? That's what our leaders see that's not occurring. And then when they see different kinds of leadership very close by in states around us, Indiana, Wisconsin, and others, it's not that their tax policy is all that much greater, but what they see is a state, it is in Indiana as a case, that the regulatory red tape is not a problem. Uh, I could talk and by for, not a problem, you mean it's not onerous or that they make a decision They make quicker. decisions and they get it done quicker. As an example, a year ago right now we passed the major uh, fracturing law that has the potential to open up an area in southeastern Illinois, a very challenged area economically, to the opportunities that are going on in the oil boom that is occurring across right. this country. A billion barrels have been brought out of the ground in the North Dakota Balkan areas. Down in the North Texas field, uh, they have a half a million barrels a day, or uh, half a million barrels a day being produced down there. We produce 29,000 barrels of oil a day in Illinois. Now, we're a year one of that since that bill has passed. We still can't get the rules and regs out of the Department of Natural Resources to get that program moving. Indiana passed a law very similar time that we did, already got the rules passed. Their rules are very much specific. They protect the environment. They protect all the things that we want to protect in southern Illinois. 
but the opportunity for the jobs and the growth and creation not going. That's an example of why Illinois seems to be a hard place to do business, and that needs to change. When your organization talks to those in government and you bring up these issues? They're all polite, very polite, in trying to get it done. It's the same problem that we have in Congress. Everybody wants to help, but nobody seems to want to be able to take the kind of hard decisions. When I got started in this business back in the 70s and the ability for Democrats and Republicans to work together, it was a different time and a different era, and I understand that. And what things were yesterday never will be the same tomorrow. But the reality of it is that people rolled up their sleeves, the Alan Dixons of the world worked with the Jim Thompsons of the world. And those kind of folks got things done and we move things forward. That's what we need to return to in this state is the ability of the legislature, the governor's office, come together, sit down, solve some problems. And that's will send a message to the folks that I listen to on a day in and day out basis. Maybe Illinois is ready to work again. How much are your members, you mentioned how some of them talk about they may want to move or maybe if they're, as uh, the head of Caterpillar said about a year ago, uh, they're not necessarily going to move out of the state, but they're not going to build a new plant in That's the state. The they're going to build it. Exactly. To what extent are they sitting on the fence at this point? And uh, the essence of my question is how much time do we have to get our house in order before the manufacturing base goes, you know, uh, Texas or other states are just a better place to go? I wrote an article that was published around various newspapers uh, not long ago that was based on uh, just my observations of traveling around Illinois and uh, the title of the, ar the article was it's closing one day at a time and that's what's sort of happening it's sort of a slow drip that's occurring. Uh, when I started in this job in 1991 we had nearly a million manufacturing employees in this state today we're just at 600,000. That 400,000 didn't disappear overnight. It didn't disappear just because of the bad economic climate of the state. It disappeared for a whole host of reasons. Uh, innovation, the fact that you can do more with less. Our output is nearly the same. Yeah, I technology mean, allows us to allows do more us with to less do people, that. right? But the growth opportunities are not there. And that's what's really concerning to me. And, and you hit the nail on the head when uh, executives of companies like Cat or Deer, located here, big facilities, white collar, running the companies, things of that nature, but they're putting plants in Iowa or they're putting them in Tennessee. And it's not just big companies. I can point to small manufacturers on my board of directors that in the last five years put a plant in Iowa, put one in Tennessee, just opened one in Indiana. And essentially moving the bulk of their manufacturing processes to those new facilities. Why did it occur? Not because they were offered big incentives or, you know, to come here but their workers' comp costs were going to be less. Their training of new, new employee fashion. Uh, the local um, uh, leadership in those communities were welcoming and saying, we can provide what you need. The roads, the water lines, all of those things that make a facility come to life can be done seemingly quicker and easier and better in other places. You know, we started talking about this uh, opportunity coalition that you're launching, uh, but on the other hand, if you were trying to communicate, as we are right here, to the man on the street, the person that's working at whatever they're working at, maybe they're school teachers or whatever, and they're trying to get a handle on, okay, what do I need to know? What do we need to change? And if I talk to my lawmakers and say, let's get this state moving again. If Greg Bays was the governor, now what would you change? You, when we hear things like workers' comp, I mean, I think that somewhat goes in one ear and not the other because they don't grasp they it. Don't grasp. What's that's wrong true. with work, workers' comp from your standpoint in the state of Illinois? that it is so onerous to those who are in the manufacturing trade or business in general in Illinois? Well, workers' comp is a specific uh, cost, is a major uh, portion of any manufacturer or it actually any business and having to protect their workers. And there's no question about that uh, where we are from where we were a hundred years ago, and that's really when the comp laws came into effect, that workplaces have to be safe. What Illinois has allowed to occur over the last couple of decades is the fact that when someone has an injury, let's say, to their hand, it's caught in a piece of machinery or whatever, that they've lost partial use of that particular hand or a finger or even loss of hand. The compensation amount that the person is given for that loss is anywhere from 10 to 20 percent higher than if that same injury had occurred in Indiana that it would be worth. The second component of that is also the medical side, the medical cost that is involved in treating a person who's injured. We allow the medical community, we allow the chiropractic community, we allow the physical therapy community 
to charge higher rates for you to be treated in a work comp case than when you would be if you were just normally going in and the injury had occurred in your home and a comp case was not in consideration. Those kinds so of things. a broken arm is not a broken arm. Well, a broken arm is considered to be more valuable in, in its compensation and what the broken arm is going to cost you if you are a comp case versus this. The doctor will tell you, well, that's going to cost us more time-wise to get compensated. That's why we have to charge more. So what we have allowed, what we have allowed here is all the people who are involved in participating in the workers' comp system, a bigger piece of the pie than other states have allowed, and that's one of the reasons that those costs are there. And my members, when they get that insurance bill or their self-insured tab that they've got to put aside for that, and they have a facility in Indiana or Tennessee, and they see the insurance bill there that may be 20, 30, 40 percent higher, they say, why are we doing this? And when we're talking about And in this, real dollars, I was going to say, when you have 100, 200, it might 500 be to people. a small company, uh, a... Um, a comp bill, an insurance bill of $70,000 a year. It might be of a larger company, it may be four or five million dollars a year, or upwards of six more than that four would be. So it's, it's significantly different, and that's what you, they really see, and that's why that. But you asked another question earlier about what would you do? Right. If I'm a family member, in, or if I'm my fam young family living in uh, downstate Illinois, uh, I've got a job at a manufacturing facility that I don't see reinvestment going in, capital improvements. It's the first sign that an owner or a company that owns it is not putting money in, that it's headed down the path to potentially not going there. I say to myself, where are my kids? What's going to be the opportunity for them on an education side? Uh, are our schools going to be funded? Will the local hospital be able to stay open? Is the quality of life in this particular town in downstate Illinois going to be the same as it was when I grew up? And that was the lament a little bit of the article I talked about a bit ago is that downstate Illinois has been hollowed out in many places where manufacturing used to be. And you take it to Chicago on the other hand on the west and south side of the city where you have the kind of gang violence and issues going on that we hear about from every weekend, those used to be the manufacturing centers in the city of Chicago. So those kind of jobs have social costs when they're lost, much more so than just the individuals who lose those jobs, and long term to the schools, to the hospitals, to the other social services that are necessary. So my point would be, if you're saying to your lawmaker, wake up. Let's, how do we create jobs? We uh, do a lot of polling and know a lot of information about various issues. And one of the things when you ask people, what do you want to see done? They want to see opportunities for their children. They want to see businesses be competitive with surrounding states. And they want to make sure that the quality of life is going to improve in their communities. So that's the message I'd be giving to lawmakers when they come down here and they want to worry about things like plastic bags or the fact that the minimum wage may be a way to solve a different problem. Minimum wage is not got to get us out of our economic doldrums or problems. It's important to keep up, not going to argue what the dollar should be, but it's not the answer. Minimum wage is exactly that, minimum wage. We need to be creating jobs at the manufacturing sector, the high-tech sector. I mean, Illinois is still attracting the kind of young people and growth and through the Midwest. We need to capture that and keep that going. But they're not going to stay here if they don't think it's a state that's being run well. Before we uh, run out of time entirely, let's obviously we're in the midst of a gubernatorial race that's just starting to heat up. Now we know who the nominees are. Bruce Rauner is a businessman, but not not a manufacturer. Not I mean, he's, he comes from more of the investment he's bought some. world. <laughs> he's bought some, I guess so. Uh, and I, I, I believe, I mean, you were an, as an organization nonpartisan, you work with mm -hmm. both sides of the aisles. But from what you hear, do you want to take a take a stab at what, what, what are you hearing? What's your reaction to what you hear from either uh, Mr. Rauner or the governor? Well, business community is, uh, many leaders of the business community are very strongly for Mr. Rauner. They know him. He, he comes from a background that makes him comfortable. Uh, a lot of them feel that he needs to be the next governor to sort of shake things up, not to use his uh, tagline. Governor Quinn has proven to be a very agile and uh, a good politician over the years. And uh, uh, to his credit, uh, he's, a t he's had to work through some very difficult problems since he took over after Bogoyevich. One of the concerns I have is that the state really hasn't had strong executive leadership for over a decade. Um, Bogoyevich was a disaster. Last couple of years of George Ryan, because of his problems, really had a little impact. 
and one can be critical of Quinn on being able to uh, put an agenda forward and make the legislature follow. The legislative animal body in our country and in the state is not meant to lead, it's meant to follow. So the state needs an agenda to be set. I would urge both Governor Quinn and Bruce Brown to really lay out that agenda so that we can have a clear picture. I think philosophy, we can see what the different philosophies are. But what's the particular significance of this issue versus that issue? When you get into the weeds on issues like workers' comp, how would you handle the fact that the medical community charges more for an injury in workers' comp arena than they do in the uh, normal area. How would you decide whether or not the, the comp cost for an injury while it's less expensive in Indiana versus Illinois? Can you get the votes in the legislature to make those changes? Tell us how you're going to do that. That's what I mean by an agenda that my members will be listening for. Fiscal responsibility, both at the federal and state level is an absolute must. And finally, I think that we need to have a, a leader that can talk about the values and the positive sides of what Illinois is about. The state's not going to go away. Our location's not going to change. Chicago is not Detroit. But if we don't move, if we don't change, it could go bankrupt. It could go so. that way. Exactly. So, right. I mean, with this, the, the state pension, in fact, there's a pension panel talking about the Chicago pension problems. Uh, a billion dollar today. payment next year out of uh, what, a $6 billion uh, general fund? So their problems are exponentially growing as well. That has got to be, uh, but that's not a unique problem to just Illinois. Right. Municipalities, local governments, state governments have this problem. Others have done a better job at doing it than we have. Well, last thing, and I, this is a non-economic issue, but I don't know to what extent it's on your radar or not at all. Uh, this uh, Bruce Rauner's pushing the term limits initiative. I think it's popular among a lot of people. He got 591,000 people to sign uh, the petition. Does that appear at all in your list of things that would be interesting? And from one who's followed Illinois politics for some decades, uh, what, what's your thoughts on term Philosophically, limits? I don't like term limits. I will go with what our founding fathers said about it, that it was not an appropriate uh, have our, our situation. I think the voters should. I think the fair map proposal is a much more uh, direct way to, to make a change, make sure that voters get to pick their districts, not politicians picking their districts. I think that would solve both at the national level and, I mean, at the congressional level, there maybe are 40 or 50 competitive seats across the country. In Illinois, there may be a less than a dozen competitive seats in the Illinois legislature. Changing the reapportionment matter in the way we do it, I think, would have a longer term effect on it than the term limits. But there is an attraction to that, and I think it's maybe the issue du jour. And uh, so it's not a big issue with the manufacturers or me personally, but that's just a personal opinion. Well, Greg Bays, thank you again for joining us mm -hmm. and sharing your thoughts. We appreciate it. Thanks for coming by today. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel to gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois.